Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Tim Poe. I'm Director of Telehealth with the UNC Cancer Network. Thank you so much for being here today, March 13, 2019, for our RN and Allied Health Lecture. Just a few things I want to go over before we meet our speaker and get started. Uh, if you are having any te technical difficulties whatsoever, please call us right away, 919-445-1000. Let us know. We can help you out, uh, hopefully get you a, a, an improved connection if there's any sort of problem. We are uh, also available by email, unccn at unc.edu. Our website is unccn.org. You'll find a wealth of information there, including over 200 previous lectures, including our learning portal, where you'll be able to view this and many other lectures on your own schedule. If live just doesn't work for you, uh, you'll be able to find out about all sorts of upcoming events as well. Let's see, what else? If you want to go directly to our learning portal, that's learn.unccn.org. You'd go there if you know you want to go straight to where you'll be viewing uh, the recorded lectures for credit. Uh, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, uh, several other places you can find us, but that's probably enough about that. We will be using Poll Everywhere today, and Poll Everywhere is great because it allows you to connect with our presenter. Uh, he will be asking questions throughout the lecture. This is your opportunity to anonymously answer these questions. We hope that all of you will participate. Uh, all you need to do, easiest way to participate, is just go to pollev, P-O-L-L-E-V, dot com forward slash UNCCN. Do that on a smartphone, on a tablet, on a, any sort of computer with a browser, and you'll be able to go there. The questions will pop up one by one. You can answer them uh, very easy. If you would prefer to do this via a phone with texting capabilities, that's fine as well. All you need to do is one time You'll go ahead and in the to field type in 22333, and in the message field you'll type in UNCCN. Just do that one time, you'll get a little message back, it will say joined, and then you can go ahead and use the corresponding letters that go with uh, the, the questions. And then at the end, whether you've used the web or whether you're texting, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. So please be jotting those down somewhere throughout uh, the presentation. And then when we get to the end, please share those questions with our presenter, uh, and we'll answer as many as we can in the, in the time at the end. All right. Poll everywhere question that we'll start off with. Hopefully this is kind of a softball for you. But which of the following statements regarding cancer-related cognitive dysfunction, CRCD, is true? And that would be incidence rates of CRCD range from 17 to 75 percent. A. CRCD can be debilitating. B. CRCD can be enduring. C. Or all of the above. D. Go ahead, again, this is anonymous, as are all of the questions. If you'll go ahead and submit that one, and then we'll see the, the uh, real-time answers in just a moment. All right. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Zeb Nakamura, MD. Thank you so much for being here with Thank us you. today. So let's see, what do we know about you here? Um, you're MD in, uh, and you're a consultation liaison, psychiatry fellow at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. That's right. And you've been here how long? About five years. Great, yeah. great. Uh, completed undergraduate education at Vassar College, medical uh, school at the Keck School of Medicine of the University of South Cal Cal Southern California, and general psychiatry residency at UNC and particular interest in psycho-oncology, delirium, and cancer-related cognitive impairment. Does that cover the professional yeah, yeah, aspects? Yeah, thanks so much. Right, absolutely. What's something else we should know about you that's not uh, in your professional uh, bio there? I'm really looking forward to the spring weather because great. I'm a softball player. Okay. Uh, so looking forward to getting back out in the left field. Great, yeah. great. Well, it, it seems like it's almost here. Although you never know. That's <laughs> true. Here. It's true. Okay, good deal. Well, uh, without further ado, let's look. Uh, let's see. We're definitely uh, trending on this first poll everywhere poll. Uh, how are they doing? That looks good to me. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, so all of these things associated with CRCD. Great. And uh, the questions will we'll get obviously more involved as, as we go along. So cancer-related cognitive impairment, more than a side effect of chemotherapy with Dr. Nakamura. I'll pass the controls over to you. And let me get you the mouse in case you'd like to use that as a cursor during the presentation. All right. Thank you so much for having me. 
um, look forward to hopefully being able to share some information uh, about this really important consequence of cancer and cancer care. So in terms of the way that all the talk will be structured today, I'll start out by providing some background on um, cancer-related cognitive impairment, discuss some contributors or causes of cancer-related cognitive impairment, especially those outside of chemotherapy, which I think has gotten the most attention, um, discuss, hopefully not in too much um, painful detail, some of the underlying biologic mechanisms of this. In sort of the middle third of the talk, I'd like to discuss briefly a study that I did in collaboration with our geriatric oncology program here, looking at the connection between cognitive function and physical function or functional status. And then in the last third, try to um, make things as practical as I can as it relates to um, how CRCI is screened for or diagnosed and what treatment options are available. So learning objectives essentially follow sort of the highlights of the, um, of the outline for our talk. So just to start out with a little bit of historical perspective, there, the first published report about um, what we now often refer to as chemo brain was actually in 1980. Um, this was published, interestingly enough, in the American Journal of Psychiatry, so first in the psychiatry literature, not in the oncology literature, by Thomas Oxman and colleagues at Dartmouth, suggesting there was at least an awareness of chemo brain going back to the 1970s. For whatever reason, there really wasn't much published on this for the next um, close to 20 years, and it wasn't until the mid-90s that the term chemo brain really uh, took hold and then we started to see a lot of studies primarily in patients with breast cancer showing that they were experiencing cognitive issues um, in the setting of chemotherapy. In 2002, Tim Aulis, who's one of the leaders in this field, showed that patients even many years out from chemotherapy were still experiencing significant cognitive issues and then it wasn't until 2004 that Jeff Waifel and colleagues were able to show that patients had cognitive issues before even starting chemo, uh, that got worse during chemotherapy, and then persisted for many months after. And then it's really been about the last 15 to 20 years um, that there's been a growing appreciation that this is not just a consequence of chemotherapy, but of cancer itself and other cancer treatments. And as a result, the name has changed, at least among people who are in the field, from chemo brain to either cancer-related cognitive impairment, CRCI, which is how I'll um, refer to it throughout the lecture, or cancer-related cognitive dysfunction, CRCD. So in terms of the type of issues that are experienced by patients as a consequence of cancer and its treatments, um, I think the most important take-home here is that there's no single type or area of cognition that's most affected. It really can be all aspects. One of the areas that's gotten the most attention is, is memory, and specifically working memory. So working memory refers to things like being able to remember a phone number, uh, what things you want to get at the grocery store, instructions that were just given to you. So things that you're not necessarily committing to long-term memory, but things that you need to hold kind of in the front of your mind. There are certainly effects that have been observed with attention or concentration, ability, people's ability to plan um, sort of tasks or goals that they want to complete, it's very hard for patients who experience CRCI to learn new material. And then the presentation can uh, vary considerably. So the symptoms can be rather subtle, and that's actually probably the most common way that they present, or they can be dramatic enough to really uh, significantly impact someone's quality of life. And then the course can be uh, variable as well. So sometimes, you know, I'll hear patients say that, they just notice feeling a little bit off for the couple days after the chemotherapy treatment, and then there are other folks who really suffer for, for years or even decades. So this leads us to our first poll everywhere question, um, and it's getting at what are the consequences of cancer-related cognitive impairment that have been really uh, clearly defined in the literature. Um, and so this is to highlight kind of the wide range of, of types of problems that occur, and so A, can it inc actually increase the risk of dementia? That has it clearly been sh shown to affect people's occupational outcomes or physical abilities? Uh, do we know that it affects quality of life across the board, or is it really all of these? 
All right. And we just want to say thank you to our audience for, for engaging so quickly and for, for so many of you getting involved with the discussion here. Uh, so again, it looks like we've got a pretty strong trend. How are they doing? I think they're doing great. Good. So Good. my goal here was not to present a challenging question, but instead to emphasize all these areas that are affected and, you know, we'll hone in on each one kind of as we move along here. Great. So in terms of how common this is, again, I mentioned it's only been more recently that we've started to look at people throughout their course of cancer care. And it's in these studies that we found that up to 30% of people will experience cognitive impairment even before starting chemotherapy. And then this number shoots up pretty high um, in the setting of active cancer treatment. And most of the research is specifically with chemotherapy to as high as 75%. And then it's a little bit less clear, but somewhere between 15 to 50 percent will continue to show impairment in their cognitive function um, for years afterwards. And there's actually even one study, this is now uh, reporting on folks who probably received cancer treatments that aren't exactly the standard of care anymore, but showing that people can experience cognitive issues for greater than 20 years. So in terms of its significance, and this is kind of getting at the poll everywhere question, we certainly know that there's a very clear association between CRCI and depression anxiety. What we don't know is if it's that depression anxiety is leading to CRCI, if CRCI is leading to depression anxiety, or most likely there's an underlying um, you know, cascade of factors that are going on within someone's sort of biological systems that are contributing to both. We do know that people who develop CRCI really do have a hard time getting back to work, especially at the level that they were at before. There's been one study that's clearly shown that it increases the risk of dementia by twofold. Almost every study shows that it's associated with worse quality of life. And then just in the last year, there was a study that demonstrated in patients with hematologic malignancies that those who presented to their oncologist with cognitive issues ended up having a decreased lifespan. We also know, again, from recent uh, work, that it affects oncologists providing practices. So in this study, again, from within the last year, they asked oncologists a number of questions to get at the types of things that impact um, whether or not they would offer chemotherapy to patients with advanced cancer. And cognitive dysfunction turned to be a greater predictor of not offering treatment, even compared to age and functional status. And then perhaps most importantly, this is one of the most feared consequences of um, cancer care among cancer survivors. So now we're at our second Poll Everywhere question, again, to hopefully illustrate the wide scoping range of this, and it's what can cause cancer-related cognitive impairment. I've already alluded to this somewhat. We know for sure that chemotherapy does this, and there's by far the most data on the effect of chemotherapy. But we'll show kind of as we move along that there are other contributors here as well. Great. And uh, just, a, just a reminder for those of you who are texting, if, if you uh, want to put in uh, your answer, uh, chemotherapy A, surgery B, radiation C, hormone therapy, D, or E, all of the above. Um, looks like E is, is a and solid he, win there. E is, the, is winning, and it's the, the correct answer. Great. So I want to just briefly touch on this um, idea of neuroplasticity. It will come up a couple points in the talk, so I just want to kind of explain what it is and how it might relate to cancer-related cognitive impairment. So neuroplasticity refers to the brain's ability to reorganize itself, to repair and adapt in the setting of injury. So, you know, certainly CRCI is a relatively newer concept, so this has been better studied in the setting of things like stroke or traumatic brain injury. Um, but what we've found out kind of in the research over the, you know, again, last 10, 15 years is that for CRCI, most of this natural brain recovery seems to occur within the first two years after diagnosis and treatment. Of course, this doesn't fit perfectly with patient's experience, so we have some people who may not notice any problems at all, and others whose symptoms will persist way beyond this one to two year time frame. 
So now we're going to talk um, a little bit about the ways in which cancer treatments um, lead to these adverse cognitive outcomes. So the first is direct toxicity. Um, this is probably the most controversial contributor, but I think that it's real. So in general, chemotherapy is not thought to cross the blood-brain barrier where it would directly access the brain. But we do have reason to believe that at least very small doses do get through, not nearly enough to kill cancer, but enough to cause problems and kill brain cells. And this has been demonstrated mostly in studies with animals, um, but it does show that there's this negative effect of even the smallest doses of chemotherapy on certain regions of the brain. Then one of the more popular ideas, and we'll talk about this in more detail later, is that increased inflammation is really behind a lot of this. And then a related concept is that there's increased oxidative stress. So you may have heard of reactive oxygen species or reactive nitrogen species. So we know that these are elevated in the central nervous system in patients with cancer and patients who are receiving chemotherapy. The next thing that I'll acknowledge is that we are also getting increasing information that there really is a genetic component here. There are both genetic factors that help protect someone from developing cancer-related cognitive impairment and those that increase their risk. So you may have heard um, about the APOE E4 allele. It's very um, well described as a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, and we now know that this is also a risk factor for developing cancer-related cognitive impairment or for having more severe problems related to CRCI. There's another gene, the COMT gene. This is involved in metabolism of things like dopamine and serotonin. Um, and if you have this one particular single nucleotide polymorphism, you're also at greater risk for experiencing CRCI. The um, specific genotype of BDNF, or brain-derived neurotrophic factor, is thought to be protective. And then there likely is a huge host of genes that are related to neuroplasticity, which we just talked about, DNA damage and repair, and those that mediate inflammation that also probably increase or decrease folks' risk for developing CRCI. So while we're on the topic of genetics, I wanted to talk about this really interesting study that was done now about 12 years ago um, by Ferguson and colleagues. And so this study um, looked at one 60-year-old uh, woman with breast cancer who was receiving chemotherapy who had an identical twin who did not have breast cancer and was not exposed to chemotherapy. The patient with breast cancer is in the A panels and her identical sister is in the B panels. So they asked um, the sisters both how um, severe they felt like their cognitive issues were that they were experiencing, and then also had them do several tests of their cognition. And while they were doing their tests, they did imaging as well. So what's shown here is functional MRI, but they also got sort of more standard MRI just to look at the shape of the brain and that sort of thing. And there were some really interesting findings. So the first thing that's indicated here in the... Um, in the images is that while they're doing this test of working memory that's increasing in difficulty from the left side of your screen to the right side of your screen, the patient with breast cancer was immediately having to recruit more areas of her brain to complete even the simplest working memory task, whereas her sister without cancer was barely having to fire to do the same thing. And you can see as you go from easier tasks on the left to the harder tasks on the right, that the patient with breast cancer was continuing to have to work a lot harder. What's even more interesting here is that they actually didn't perform too differently on this test. So the woman with breast cancer did do worse, but the difference was actually pretty small. What was of interest, however, was that she said that she was really struggling. So she was really feeling um, that this was a super challenging task, even though she actually did all right on the test. So then talking about other things that we do see on imaging, again, that was functional MRI, but even in other types of imaging, we can see that overall patients with CRCI have decreased volumes of their brain, that through certain specialized imaging techniques that their white matter seems to be connected in a less complex way, 
Um, as we just saw in the previous slide, that they have changes in um, their sort of functional brain activation, and that in the kind of whole group of studies we have, that these changes, having a smaller brain, having de decreased functional activity, have both been shown to relate to patients' self-report of how their cognitive function is, as well as how they do on objective testing. So now we're going to spend the next couple slides talking about inflammation because, again, I think that um, this is one of the most um, intriguing hypotheses in terms of how this is happening. So in general, we know that patients with cancer have a higher degree of inflammation, as do patients with neurocognitive disorders like Alzheimer's or like vascular dementia. Um, we know that when patients with cancer start chemotherapy, that the level of their inflammatory cytokines goes up, and that after chemotherapy ends, that they start to decrease, but that they can remain elevated again for years. We know that to some degree that the degree of increase or level of inflammatory cytokines can correlate with both self-reported and objectively measured cognitive function and can correlate with the size of the hippocampus, which many of you may remember is related to um, kind of memory storage in the brain and brain metabolism in certain regions. Certainly this nice story of elevated inflammation in cancer that goes up with treatment, goes down after treatment, hasn't been shown for every single cytokine. And the strongest data that does kind of follow this story are with these three, TNF-alpha, IL-6 and IL-1 beta, and certainly this sort of presents the question of could this inform certain specific treatment strategies, specifically drug therapies. Now this is taking a sort of 20,000, 30,000 foot view to sum up kind of how complicated this is, and I'll just kind of review it briefly. So again, in patients with cancer, in their peripheral bloodstream, they certainly have elevated levels of inflammatory cytokines, even though most of the chemotherapy doesn't cross into the CNS, that the inflammatory cytokines can cross over either passively or through uptake with special proteins. Then when they get across to the brain, they stimulate additional cell types in the brain to release even more of these inflammatory cytokines, and then they go out and interact with a number of systems, including the hypothalamic pituitary axis, especially um, involving cortisol, to generate reactive oxygen species, as we talked about before, and then impact in a negative way pathways that are, again, related to dopamine, serotonin, to neuroplasticity, and to something called neuro neuronal excitotoxicity, which basically the downstream effect is killing brain cells. Another really interesting angle to explore with CRCI is how cancer and cancer treatment lines up with general aging. So we know that patients with cancer have these chronic inflammation states with increased oxidative stress that eventually can lead to DNA damage. We've also seen um, an effect on telomeres, which ultimately results in cell senescence. So the gist of this is that in all people, as they age and their cells divide, the ends of their chromosomes, which are called telomeres, shorten. And when they become short enough, a cell can no longer divide and it falls into this senescent state. What's really interesting is that we've been able to show that cancer treatment itself also leads to an acceleration of the shortening of these telomeres. In a very really compelling set of experiments actually done here at UNC. Um, they looked at levels of a biomarker called P16. P16 is essentially something that can be measured in the blood that correlates with aging. And they showed that in patients with cancer who are receiving chemotherapy by looking at P16 levels, that their course of treatment essentially correlated with 10 years of aging. So this was certainly a remarkable finding, continues to be an area of active discovery. And then in a, I'll say, kind of related study, this one in rats, they're able to show that rats that were exposed to chemotherapy treatments, equivalent to what's used currently in breast cancer, that there was an activation of these two pathways also involved in aging. 
So a kind of simple way to look at that, this is by the schematic uh, presented by Tim Alice that shows, of course, that as we all get older, that our cognitive function declines to some degree. Then there's these sort of two competing hypotheses in cancer, which we don't know exactly which one is more right or if it's some kind of combination of both. But in the first, the phase shift hypothesis, when patients get cancer and start treatment, that there is this sort of hit that they take and their cognitive function sort of immediately is worse, but then over time it continues to decline on the same trajectory as if they didn't have cancer. And then the alternative hypothesis is this accelerated aging hypothesis, that not only do they take some sort of hit initially, but as they age, um, that the rate of decline is also greater. So now I'm going to go through different aspects of cancer and cancer care, uh, in some degree summarizing, in some ways presenting some new information about how each of these aspects may contribute to cognitive problems in patients. So to this point, we've mostly been talking about patients that do not affect the central nervous uh, system. We've talked about the mechanism so far, but what we haven't said as explicitly is if you're feeling really physically ill, if you're feeling fatigued, or you're feeling depressed, that you're not only likely to feel like you're having cognitive issues, but you're probably also going to perform worse on the tests. So we'll talk more about this idea of comorbidity that starts to hopefully raise the idea that this is a very complicated process and that none of these are really occurring in isolation. And then things get even more complicated if you have a cancer that's in your brain or a, a metastases in the brain. And so for these folks, in addition to all the different ways that they experience dysfunction, as we've already talked about, they can have swelling in the brain that can move brain tissue from its typical spot, lead to increased pressure, and ultimately de decrease blood supply to certain areas of the brain. So you can certainly imagine how that would further exacerbate cognitive problems. So um, I'll point out at this point that as we go on these next few slides, the references at the bottom are basically studies that have shown this, but I'm going to be talking about this in mostly a general um, term kind of for, uh, to hope dri drive home some of the most important points. So we've mostly up to this point talked about chemotherapy and all the ways that it can um, elicit damage to the brain and cause cognitive issues. And so the one thing that I'll really highlight here that I haven't said already is that once a neuron dies, as a consequence of these variety of mechanisms, it's gone forever. So that same neuron can't come back to life. There are specific areas of the brain that can generate new neurons, um, but once a neuron dies, it's gone forever. So then moving forward to surgery, this is an area that's not particularly well studied, and a big part of that is because uh, a lot of patients with cancer go to surgery so early on in their care that it's hard to capture them for research studies. We do know that, for example, in brain tumors, that surgery can either worsen cognitive issues, but it can also improve them as well. And it really depends on where the tumor is, um, the size of the tumor, and sort of other aspects um, that are inherent in the surgery. What we do know, um, which is perhaps surprising, is that even surgery that has nothing to do with the brain, so for example, a mastectomy, has been shown to lead to adverse cognitive effects. We don't know for sure why this is, but there are some hypotheses related to the effects of surgery on inflammation, the effects of surgery on pain, and I also wonder about the possibility that after surgery, if a patient were to become confused as a part of a delirium, what sort of long-term effects that that would have on their cognitive function. There are some research as well to show that the anesthesia that patients receive as a part of surgery um, may also be highly driving some of these issues, and that the type of anesthesia and amount of anesthesia can lead to a variable effect as it relates to the cognitive effects of what's experienced after surgery. So now talking a little bit in, radiation, in terms of radiation. So any kind of radiation where there's going to be um, direct effects on the brain certainly going to affect brain tissue through a lot of the mechanisms that we've described. But even local radiation, so again to take the kind of corollary of mastectomy, Local radiation to the breast has been shown to lead to adverse cognitive effects, and that's thought to occur, again, in, via similar mechanisms, perhaps damaging DNA, perhaps leading to inflammation. And then finally, we'll talk about hormonal therapy, which I think is a really interesting area 
and the research on this has been kind of growing very quickly. And so we know that in general, both estrogen and testosterone support brain function. Um, patients who receive tamoxifen have been shown to develop smaller hippocampal size. We know that there have been some studies that describe that patients who receive chemotherapy and tamoxifen have greater issues with cognition than those who receive chemotherapy alone. But this is not um, a consistent finding, as there are other studies that have shown no association at all with tamoxifen. There's growing interest in aromatase inhibitors um, and their effects on cognitive decline, and a lot of the most exciting work in that area is led by Kathy Bender and her colleagues at um, Pitt. And then finally, in prostate cancer, androgen deprivation therapy has certainly been shown to lead to adverse cognitive consequences. So I alluded to this earlier, but I'll say it again. There are numerous comorbidities that affect cognitive function. So I mentioned depression, anxiety, distress. Anyone who's had a bad night of sleep or several bad nights of sleep knows that that can affect cognitive ability. Being in pain or being on a number of medications, including pain medications, can alter cognition. Other sorts of physical or medical illnesses outside of cancer can adversely affect one's cognitive ability, and so can fatigue, which we know is so common in our patients. This is a really nice um, schematic presented by Tim Alice and James Root in the recent review. And I think what I want to highlight here is that on the left kind of panel of the image, you essentially have factors that the patients come to you with that you really can't do a whole lot about. They're going to come to you with their certain genetic factors, um, with things that are inherent to their tumor, and all those things are going to set up this patient to some degree for cognitive issues. But then there's a whole host of factors, of the you know five or so boxes on the right, where there may be opportunities to intervene. So it may be that if someone's depressed or anxious, that you may be able to treat that and improve cognitive function somewhat. Uh, you may be able to get them to exercise. You may be able to optimize other parts of their medical care. Um, and then I think the other thing that this uh, schematic really kind of brings into play is there's just so many factors, and probably not all these factors apply to all patients. And so the dream certainly would be when you see a patient early on in their treatment, be able to identify what their unique risk factors are and be able to get them into treatment or maybe even prevention programs that can try to mitigate their risk of developing CRCI at all or at least limiting the degree to which they're affected by it. Now I'm going to talk just for a couple moments about um, measurement. I sort of alluded to this, but there is this sort of dichotomy in the field between patient self-report and objectively measure cognitive function. And I'll say in a very direct um, way that we know that people's self-report of cognitive issues is much more common than our ability to measure it objectively. And this discourse has raised a wide debate of which one is better and which aspects of which ones are better. And I think sort of the main criticisms are as follows. So in self-report, there's the concern that maybe you're not actually measuring cognitive impairment truly, but instead you're picking up on some sort of surrogate for a patient being more anxious about the symptoms they're experiencing, whereas there's a group of people who are more critical of the objective measurements and wonder, well, are they really sensitive enough? If you're having people perform these tests, some of maybe which they've encountered before in a highly controlled setting that's not nearly as complicated as the real world, and even if they are reliable, is it feasible to get patients testing? Neuropsych testing takes two to three hours to complete and is only done by people who are highly trained in the, in the area. So then there's a the question of how do we utilize all this in the patients that we see? In terms of the measures that um, exist, there's several measures that can be used for self-report. Um, the FACT COG is approximately 40 items long, has different domains, and maybe a little bit longer than something that you'd be interested in using, um, but I use it and find it helpful. The PROMISE Cognitive Function is a nice alternative. Um, it's only eight items long, and there are sort of good uh, age match controls to compare the data to. And then there are these longer measures, like the European Organization of Research and Treatment of Cancer um, questionnaire and the PRO-CTCIE, which look at a 
broad swath of symptoms experienced by patients during cancer with a couple items dedicated to cognitive function. There is a group that sort of oversees this area of research called the International Cognition and Cancer Task Force, and they have specific recommendations as it relates to what should be included in all neuropsych tests. And these cover the domains that we've discussed previously in terms of memory, um, processing speed, executive function, and language that we know are affected by cancer-related cognitive impairment. And then maybe somewhere in between these two are measures that can be administered by a clinician or by someone working with a patient. And some of these you may have heard of before, the mini mental status exam, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, and the R bands. And so to kind of think about who can employ which ones and what might be useful for you in your practice. I think anyone can utilize self-report screeners. Um, so those would be, again, these kind of the first row here, FACT COG through the PRO-CTCAE. But there would have to be some discussion amongst people in the practice about sort of what would reach clinical significance and what to do with this information. The more global measures like the MMSE and MOCA could be administered by any psychiatrist or psychologist who you may liaise with. And occupational and speech therapists also have ways of measuring global cognitive function. But to really get that detailed testing, that's done through neuropsychological assessment. And at least at UNC, that's um, a task that's shared between two um, excellent neuropsychologists who are primarily based in the physical medicine and rehab program with adjunct appointments in neurology and psychiatry, um, who again are extremely highly trained people. I think when you look at this whole scope, though, there is this sort of sense of there's not a lot that seems like people on the front lines can do to try to get a sense of the cognitive issues experiencing by their patients. And so um, that leads me to kind of the study that um, I did in collaboration with the Geriatric Oncology Program in which we evaluate the utility of a highly practical measure of cognition called the BOMC. So what we did is we looked at 331 patients with breast cancer, stages one through three at UNC, who completed the cancer-specific geriatric assessment prior to starting chemotherapy. For those of you not familiar, the cancer-specific geriatric assessment contains a single measure of cognition, the BLESS orientation memory concentration test, which we'll talk more about in a moment, several measures of functional status, uh, measures of depression, anxiety, social function, support, and nutrition. And our goals were, one, simply to describe people's cognitive function prior to starting treatment using the BOMC and see what associations might exist between the BOMC and this wide array of functional, psychosocial, medical, and sociodemographic variables. So a little bit about the BOMC. So it's only six items long, takes fewer than five minutes to administer, higher scores suggest worse cognition, it was originally developed and validated in a skilled nursing facility population looking for dementia, and there had a cut point of 11. But there had been no research up to this point as to what would be seen in a cancer population and if this cut point of 11 would be um, appropriate or not. But again, the huge upswing to all this is that it certainly would be compatible from a logistical standpoint with a cancer clinic. So here's the actual BOMC. We won't go through it in detail, but it basically asks a couple questions about orientation, asks people to remember and to be able to say this memory phrase, and a couple things where they have to count backwards from 20 to 1 or months in reverse order, and that would attend, attest um, you know, attention, concentration, those sorts of things. So we had a mostly older sample, uh, mostly white, about half the folks were married, and most people were no longer employed full time as is consistent with a lot of the research in patients with breast cancer at this stage of treatment, a lot of people are experiencing clinically significant anxiety, and a quarter were experiencing depression, and most people who were depressed were also anxious. We won't go through the details here, but this basically shows the majority of our sample, about 80%, actually had pretty good physical function across our various measures. But then I think what was the first really important take home from our study is that their cognitive function, at least according to the BOMC, looked quite good. So remember, a score of 11 or higher is what had been used previously to establish a dementia diagnosis. But like I mentioned before, too, that often CRCI presents in a very subtle way. So it's also not entirely surprising 
that we had so few people in that 11 or higher range. And currently there's a group at the University of Rochester who are exploring alternative cutoffs for CRCI. But depending on where you set the cutoff, you can certainly imagine a scenario where we're getting closer to what um, has been described previously in terms of prevalence of cognitive issues prior to treatment. In terms of the associations, a lot of things were in the expected direction. So we saw that people were older, people had fewer uh, years of education, people who were employed less than full time, all had worse cognitive function. People who were depressed or had limitation in their social activity had worse cognitive function. And then the second, I'd say, most kind of a uh, remarkable part of our study was that by every measure looked at, cognitive function and physical function were very closely associated. So the implications of our findings were, first, that if you see a patient who has significant issues with cognition or has significant functional limitations, then that should really raise your concern for the other one. So if you see one, think about screening for the other. And the second is a treatment implication. So if these two entities are so closely linked, cognitive function and physical function, then maybe there are interventions that could simultaneously target both cognitive and physical function. You know, the thing that would first come to mind would be something like a physical activity intervention. So um, now we have our last poll everywhere question. This one is a little bit less of a softball. Um, and so the question is, which of these has not demonstrated evidence for treatment of cancer-related cognitive impairment? The first one is EPO-stimulating agents. Second, B, is galantamine, which is an Alzheimer's medication. Then yoga is C. Cognitive rehabilitation is D. And then the last is exercise, or E. Okay, we'll stop there. Uh, <laughs> looks like it looks like we've got a, a good variety of answers. It seems like there's a nicer spread. Um, mm -hmm. I think that the audience was smart by thinking that something called cognitive rehabilitation might be helpful. I kind of gave away that exercise might be useful. Sure. Um, but the right answer in this case is actually B, galantamine, and we'll okay. talk more about that in just a moment. Great. So the interventions for cancer-related cognitive impairment fall into uh, sort of these basic categories that essentially mimic kind of the poll everywhere question. So the ones with probably the most evidence are these top ones, cognitive rehabilitation, cognitive training, cognitive behavioral therapy. Physical activity has shown some uh, utility, and that includes both yoga as well as more formal exercise programs as probably most people would think of. Then there are mind-body um, interventions such as meditation, mindfulness, and acupuncture, and there are probably the least uh, number of studies to support those, but there's just a lot of limitations um, kind of across the board with research in this area. And then there are really sort of just a handful of drugs that have been looked at, and one of them, denepazil, um, is also an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor similar to galantamine, but it just happens that galantamine, the B answer from the poll everywhere just hasn't been looked at. So these are the ones that have, and we'll go through each of these um, in the sort of last five minutes or so that we have. I'll say in general that there are a lot of limitations for interventions for CRCI. So almost all the research is in patients with breast cancer, generally in survivors who completed treatment years prior. In all but one study that I can think of, the sample sizes are extremely small, and we haven't looked, um, or at least in any kind of robust way at prevention. And then even those things like cognitive rehabilitation that has been shown to be effective, that there are certainly challenges with real world access to care um, and require a, a significant amount of patient motivation and participation to, to elicit benefit. So just briefly, in terms of understanding what cognitive training is, so this is like um, really working out the muscles and the muscles, so to speak, in your brain that you have already. So this often includes repeated cognitive tasks of increasing difficulty, often on a computer, 
to try to restore some of what had gotten weakened with treatment. There have been five studies that have looked at this, and the kind of collection of it shows that perhaps what's most useful to patients is to do this several times a week for 30, 60 minutes at a time and for at least six weeks. And this is in contrast to cognitive rehabilitation, which is more about compensatory strategies. So the idea is maybe you've kind of knocked out a part of your brain, but you can find ways to work around that. Um, and this is training people in ways to do that. And so unlike cognitive training, which is often independent, multiple times a week, this is more something you would do once a week, 30, 60 minutes at a time with a highly trained professional. At UNC, the access to this kind of care would be through speech and language pathology, but other places, occupational therapy or neuropsychology. Again, you would want to check to see if this is actually covered by a patient's health insurance. In terms of physical activity, so it's thought that physical activity may work by increasing levels of BDNF, by reducing inflammation, by helping generate new neurons in the hippocampus. Um, we know that physical activity decreases the risk of Alzheimer's and slows age-related cognitive decline. Again, the research kind of altogether would suggest that the greatest benefit would be seen from at least 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity exercise or 120 minutes per week of vigorous exercise. We're very fortunate here, at least in this area, to have a number of local resources to plug patients into. And so one is our kind of well-known Get Real and Heal program, which is an exercise therapy combined with other psychosocial support, such as pain and stress management, relaxation, mindfulness, et cetera, that a number of YMCAs in the area have. Um, Live Strong exercise program, and there's several yoga studios too that are familiar specifically with working with patients with cancer. In terms of mind body, so these would include things like meditation, mindfulness, acupuncture. Um, there's some really great online classes through UCLA. There are a number of apps that patients can download to kind of help with mindfulness. And there are actually courses locally through both UNC and Duke's integrative medicine programs um, to get involved with meditation mindfulness as well. And then finally, there are a couple resources here about how to get patients linked up with acupuncture if that's something they're interested in. And then finally, with pharmacotherapies, um, you know, I've listed kind of the specific ones here in gray, but they're sort of, these are the basic categories of things that have been looked at. So more stimulant-type medications, similar to what you would be, you'd see used in um, ADHD, has been tested and been shown to be beneficial. A couple specific Alzheimer's drugs um, that work in different ways, um, denepazil, which is acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, and memantine, which is an NMDA receptor antagonist, have been looked at, again, both of which show some promising data. Um, a couple um, SSRIs have been examined. Both ginkgo biloba and vitamin E have been shown to be promising, um, but um, those data are in very small sample sizes. And then just briefly about the EPO story. So this research in the late 90s and early 2000s bore out of an observation that patients with CRCI had uh, higher rates of anemia. So there was a hypothesis, well, maybe if we treat that with EPO, their CRCI will improve. Um, there were sort of variable results in terms of how effective it was, but unfortunately in 2011, the FDA is issued a black box warning against the use of EPO-stimulating agents in cancer patients due to increased risk for negative cardiovascular outcomes um, as well as thrombotic outcomes. And I think the take home with pharmacotherapies, from my perspective as a psychiatrist, a huge benefit relative to the other things is they're available um, to many more patients. They just need someone to prescribe them, and most of these medications are relatively benign. But that being said, they do have adverse effects, can interact um, with drugs that patients are receiving for their cancer or cancer treatment, and so you really need to weigh the risk benefits in these patients. Then there are certain things that you can refer all patients to. Um, these are sort of uh, poor man's version to cognitive training and cognitive rehabilitation, but really have um, been shown to be helpful. And then patients should be pointed to places where they can look at what workplace accommodations might be available to them. Um, and then just in the last minute or so we have, I want to mention this book um, by Shelley Kessler, who's a neuropsychologist at MD Anderson, 
Cancer Center. She wrote this actually while she was at Stanford. And it's a 90-page book that covers all aspects of CRCI. I found it to be an extremely quick read and a really helpful overview. I would certainly recommend um, for anyone who's interested to read this book. Um, and it's actually aimed at patients, um, and I think it can be very helpful for patients, but I would reserve it for those patients with um, kind of higher educational levels or people who, um, you know, are, are relatively uh, high on that sort of intelligence spectrum. And then finally, I just want to give a shout out to the UNC Comprehensive Cancer Support Program, who, while not specifically focused on CRCI, you know, has done an amazing work as it relates to issues that affect cancer survivors kind of across the board. A lot of the resources I mentioned are available through the CCSP. Dr. Nakamura, thank you so much. This has been extremely informative, and I'm pleased to say we have some time for questions. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to jump right over to our Q&A uh, section of Poll Everywhere. So now is your opportunity to go ahead and share your questions with Dr. Dr. Nakamura. Uh, you can go ahead and uh, either uh, share those right over the web or you can text those in with the setup that we've done at the beginning there. So uh, I, I have several. Um, and and uh, hopefully we'll get others in sure, and, yeah. and, uh, and we'll take yours first, but the, the, our, get, our um, audience questions, but, but while we're waiting, so you said 30% of patients experience um, cognitive effects before any sort of, of medical intervention, intervention has taken place, aside from maybe testing. What, do we know what's going on there? Is that, is that simply the stress involved with, with learning about a cancer diagnosis? Oh, uh, that's, a, that's yeah. a big number, consider, considering no interventions in place yet. That's a really great question. I think uh -huh. that the folks who do research in this area would say uh -huh. that many of the same um, mechanisms I described in terms of mm -hmm. increased oxidative stress, inflammation that you see with cancer treatment also mm -hmm. occurs with cancer, and okay. that's probably a big part of what's causing it. Mm -hmm. But I think your question, or the way you framed it in terms of could just the stress right. of the cancer be contributing to this, I think, it, it's all there. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And we do have our first question that's come in. Is there a place where we can access the PowerPoint? You included some great resources to share with patients. I'm happy to take that one. If you go to our website, unccn.org, you'll find the, the presentation there, and that will include the uh, PowerPoint presentation that you're welcome to download. If you have any trouble with that, just uh, email us, unccn at unc.edu, and we'll uh, we can help you out or email that to you. What non-prescriptive interventions can we implement in someone who might be educationally challenged? That's a good question. I mean, certainly, depending on the degree of in which uh, they're challenged with these issues, that um, you're going to have limitations across the board. But I think one thing that's easy to do that's already a part of a lot of cancer care would be the physical activity. Okay. So trying to set really concrete recommendations in terms of what type of activity you do, if they can, for how many minutes. Those are, some, those are the types of things I think can be helpful to all folks yeah. in any resource setting that, or educational background that I think could be helpful. Great. Thank you. Thank you for both of those questions. Um, you mentioned genetics, APOE, and COMT, and BDNF. Um, I don't know if these are ones that are accessible at this point on something like 23andMe or Ancestry.com or whether you would need more more precise genetic screening to, to become aware of if these are present. But if they are present, um, does that change the treatment? Are, are there strategies that you might employ based on the presence of this, uh, uh, the, the, of, of one or more of these genetic markers? At this point, all we know that it increases the risk. So we don't have enough um, information to show to what degree, and mm -hmm. I think related to that, not enough information to change clinical practice. Okay. Um, but I do think, kind of thinking back to one of those big, like, landscape pictures I showed, mm -hmm. that's just another risk factor that someone's going to hold that may, depending on what other risk factors they have, impact, you know, how toxic, toxic a treatment they may potentially be offered in the future. Okay. We don't have enough information okay. yet. Okay, understood. Understood by getting into that whole intelligent medicine yes. notion. Okay. Has diet or nutrition before or during chemotherapy that are known to promote uh, brain health? 
a standard nutrition before or during chemotherapy. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure the phrasing on that, but um, it does, does that have an influence? Yeah, I think that that's a good question. I'm sure that it does, and I think that there, well, I know at the current time there's not any specific research in cancer-related cognitive impairment about that. I think what I would say, again, because it's another type of thing that anyone can do, and I think there's a lot to be said for patient empowerment, mm -hmm. that um, anything that's been shown to be helpful um, for cognitive function in general, so mm -hmm. things like leafy greens, mm -hmm. I think a really reasonable thing to recommend to patients. Okay. I know there's fascinating research going on on uh, intermittent fasting yeah. as well, and I don't know that any of that's conclusive yet. Um, let's see, is there a line drawn uh, in the decision to offer chemo in the already cognitively compromised patient before treatment? Yeah, I mean, so to clarify, I'm a psychiatrist, so mm -hmm. I certainly am not in the position of making these treatment decisions. There are studies that have been shown, again, that cognitive issues certainly impact um, oncology providers' decision about um, treatment, but I'm sure that there is not a solid line that's drawn, that it's one of several risk factors and depends on the severity of how cognitively compromised someone is. All right, thank you. Uh, so is, uh, has there been research on preventative cognitive treatment prior to cancer treatment? So in the end there where I presented all those different categories of prevention or of treatment, the only ones that have been looked at at all in a preventative way um, have been the drug therapies and those and a, only a couple of those have been looked at and those were not promising. So I think Mm -hmm. Prevention would be key in this area, and we just are not even close to having that figured out yet. Mm -hmm. It made me wonder as you were talking, because you said some of the, the, the most significant impact was during the administration of the chemotherapy. We know with preventing hair loss, the cold caps, we yeah. know there's more research coming out about the cold boots and cold gloves for, for um, peripheral neuropathy. Uh, right at the time of administration of chemo, so maybe down the road that's something we learn more about I in think, terms of cognitive. I think it's key. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see, and then what uh, ways could research be improved to parse apart cognitive impairment from normal aging versus uh, systemic therapy versus surgery? Have other studies been done? So I think one key, and um, the research overall is still lagging in this area because these studies are hard to do, but it's to focus on longitudinal studies. So ones that get patients in the study at the very beginning mm -hmm. and then follow them as long as they can. And there are just really a handful of studies in that area, and then that will help parse apart some of these things. And the other thing is going to be huge patient samples. So to be able to tell the difference between just surgery or surgery plus chemo you're going to need very large uh, patient samples, and I think that's where this is going to come from. Okay, thank you. We have three more questions on the board. I think we, if, if we're fairly quick, we have time for those. Uh, so my, my mom has bilater um, had bilateral breast cancer with uh, lobectomies and 21 doses of radiation. I've noted significant decline in, decline in memory over the past two years. How does radiation affect memory? Uh, she did not have chemo. So, um, you know, certainly her experience is not uncommon mm -hmm. um, and that we have seen that even people who have not been exposed to chemotherapy do experience cognitive issues um, from radiation alone. I know that that probably doesn't, uh, probably doesn't make it things feel any better, but it certainly is not uncommon or unexpected that from having a bout with breast cancer and having radiation alone that she would be experiencing some of these issues. All right. Uh, do you see a place for vitamin level assessment and supplementation, especially B's and D's? I know you mentioned E and the ginkgos. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, I absolutely do. I mean, as this person who uh, put the question in likely is suggesting, that again, at least apart from cancer-related cognitive impairment, that mm -hmm. both vitamin B particularly vitamin B12, vitamin B1, and then vitamin D all have a very well-described um, impact on cognitive function. Right. And I certainly, in my clinical practice, do assess these vitamin levels and supplement them if they're low. Great.
Great. Is uh, uh, cancer type a potential risk factor of CRCI or some types of cancer going to, to create um, more significant, have a more significant impact? Uh, unfortunately, we don't have enough information to know this um, yet. Really, almost all the research is in breast cancer, and so that makes it really hard to um, compare to these other populations in which there's maybe just one or two studies. Do you think that um, patients with cancers affecting the brain are at um, much higher risk because they have sort of uh, multiple different ways in which they're experiencing cognitive issues? Sure. And that makes sense. And last one, uh, curious if the provider discusses nutrition, exercise, mindfulness prior to initiating chemo as holistic care. So, again, unfortunately, um, or not unfortunately, but mm -hmm. uh, as someone who's not the person who's actually initiating chemotherapy and mm -hmm. often seeing patients later on in their course, mm -hmm. um, I don't, I'm not currently in a position to offer these things prior to their treatment starting. But certainly once I meet with people, I try to discuss what the range of options might be and usually try to pursue whatever the patient feels motivated to pursue because Great. that's likely what, to be what's most successful for them. Sure, that makes sense. Uh, I encourage our audience to check out some of our previous uh, lectures that are online. In particular, as we're discussing this, I'm thinking of some of Dr. Bottiglini's lectures mm -hmm. with, from Get Real and Heal on fitness, some of the nutrition and integrative medicine uh, lectures that, that are there in the library. Uh, with that in mind, uh, upcoming lectures, uh, Immunological Mechanisms in Pancreatic Cancer, that's March 27th at noon, and then Preparing Patients for Treatment uh, with Tammy Hallway, that's our next RN and Allied Health Lecture, and that's April 10th at noon. Uh, Self-paced courses, we have two new ones, an update on CAR-T therapy and safety considerations when managing dietary supplements in cancer care. Both of those are available now as part of our whole series of about 24 different free online courses you can take for credit. Um, Dr. Nakamura, thank you so Thanks much so for much being for here having today. You. Thank you to our audience. Do me a favor, if you would, please pass on information about these lectures to your colleagues and friends. Uh, we, would, we, we have such phenomenal lecturers such as Dr. Nakamura here today, and we would love to get the word out. So if you can tell two people this week about these lectures, uh, let them know about unccn.org. We'd really appreciate that. Any questions, you know where to find us on the web, via phone, via email. Uh, we'll see you in a few weeks. Thank you all. Have a great afternoon.